Hey, Citizens Church family, I'm so excited for uh, what feels like, in some ways, our first official Sunday gathering. So excited to get to, to kick off what hopefully is thousands more opportunities to get to sing and to get to proclaim God's word and hear God's word together. And so excited this morning uh, to be gathering with you even via long distance. We are kicking off today a series that we'll be in for the next 12 weeks, digging into the book of First. Timothy. And I'm so excited to get to sit in a book of the Bible together and just work through it a little bit at a time, not only on Sundays through preaching, but also through the week in our community groups on Tuesdays. We're actually going to be grabbing a ton of the resources that uh, Midtown is putting together for us, like a scripture reading plan and a prayer prompt guide, as well as a midweek podcast that'll accompany what we're doing on Sunday. So we just get to sit in the book of 1 Timothy for 12 weeks and see what it is that God has 
for us. And so I'm excited to dive in this morning. This, this book of 1 Timothy is one of three books of the Bible often lumped together as the pastoral epistles. So it's First and Second Timothy and Titus. And they're written by the Apostle Paul to two different pastors, Timothy and Titus. But these books are not just helpful for pastors. They're actually written as instructions for churches. Paul says this outright in 1 Timothy. In fact, the goal behind the writing of his letter and the goal really behind our whole series, he actually says in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at it together. 1 Timothy 3 verses 14 and 15. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of of the living God. So in other words, Paul says, I'm writing this letter so that the church knows what it means to be the church. The church is quite simply the people of God. The the Greek term for it is ekklesia, which means basically the called out, gathered ones. Those who put their faith in Jesus are called out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the world, out of their old ways of living and thinking, out of their old ways of being in relationship with one another, out of their old ways of spending their time and money and possessions. They're called out and set apart as holy and blameless before God. But not only are they called away from something, they're actually also called to something. They're they're gathered together into the family or the household and the kingdom of God. God is taking us from one place to another. He's making us into his people, his bride, his church. So God establishes, God brings together his people into his church. So Paul is writing this letter of 1 Timothy so that the family of God knows what it means to live out this identity together. I couldn't think of a a more fitting time to talk about what it means to be the church as we plant a church together. As we are forming and developing the culture of this brand new little thing called Citizens Church, we get to talk about what the church says the church, what the Bible says the church should be. Even as we're separated and it looks different because of COVID and all these surrounding circumstances, even as 1 Timothy tells us here that the church is not a building you go to or an event you attend, but it is a family. It is a household that you belong to. But I want us to notice how specifically Paul talks about this church at the end of verse 15. So he says, The church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The church is a pillar. It's a a buttress. It's a foundation of the truth. It's a place where, notice, the truth, absolute truth, is held up and revered and studied and taught and applied. And as we're going to see today in chapter 1, where the truth is fought for and defended. So Paul addresses here in chapter 1. So I want us to keep chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 in the back of our minds that this is the church of the living God. This is God's church called to be a foundation of the truth. I want us to remember that as we dive into chapter 1 verse 1 together. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace Mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus. All right, so so pause there. Here you have Paul. Paul writing a letter to Timothy. Timothy is one of Paul's disciples. They had traveled around together and done ministry together and planted churches together. And one of the churches they planted was the church at Ephesus. Ephesus. It's a a crazy story. You'll read about it in the scripture reading plan this week. Acts chapter 19. And there's full of riots and there's exorcisms and false teaching and all this crazy stuff that surrounds this church getting planted in the city of Ephesus. And at some point during his traveling around and planting churches, Paul has either sent or left Timothy in the city of Ephesus to pastor the church there. Now he's writing to him, giving him instructions for the church. And he's telling him to stay put. He says, Timothy, remain at Ephesus. And here's why. Verse 3, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Skip to verse 6. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law, without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. 
In other words, Timothy, I need you to stay and I need you to keep pastoring at Ephesus so that you can defend the truth and tell false teachers to sit down and be quiet. I want you to picture this scene with me. So Paul writes this letter to Timothy, but it, it wasn't just for Timothy. It actually would have been read in front of the entire church. So, so Timothy, as the pastor, gets up in front of the church at Ephesus, sitting in a room, probably not much bigger than the living room that you're in right now. And he gets up and he starts to read this letter and people are excited. They got a letter from Paul. Paul says, hey, hey, it's me, Paul. I love you, Timothy. Grace, mercy, and peace from Jesus. You're doing great. Now we need to deal with these false teachers. I mean, right from the get-go. Quick greeting, and then Paul comes out swinging. Paul so understands and believes what he's going to say in chapter 3, 14, and 15, that the church is a fortress of the truth, that he wastes no time getting to the point. He starts out, hey, Timothy, good to see you. Now we've got to deal with the false teaching and the false teachers. He says, listen, there are certain people, he calls them certain persons in the church, and they're teaching false doctrines, and they need to be addressed He says, charge them. It's the the Greek word for command. He says, tell them. Let them know, hey, this isn't going to be tolerated. This is not okay. This is the church of the living God. We teach the truth. We defend the truth. We fight for the truth. In fact, this is such a big deal that even though Paul starts by calling them certain persons, he's actually going to circle back around to this in chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He's actually going to address them by name. Let's, let's look at this together. 1 Timothy 1, verse 18. He says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting these, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Paul says, in case you're wondering who I'm talking about, in case you're looking around saying, who are these certain persons? He says, I'll tell you who they are. They're Hymenaeus and Alexander. You just feel the awkward glances dart across the room at these two individuals. He says, these two, these people are teaching false doctrines. They're teaching false teachings. Now here in in chapter 1, and we'll we'll talk about this more next week, the the false teaching specifically has to do with aspects of Jewish fables and stories and genealogies of ancient Israelite kings. So probably not the stuff you're sitting around reading about or thinking about or talking about during your social distancing, right? Probably not sitting around wondering about ancient Israelite kings and their genealogies. This is not the false teaching that you and I are going to come in contact with most likely, but, but you and I and all of us, we deal with false teaching and false teachers all of the time. I'm not just talking about that random person on the street corner yelling gibberish or that late night televangelist. I'm talking about daily. We are bombarded with lies and deceptive ideas, things that might even sound really good at first, but are actually contrary to the truths of God and the truths of the scriptures. We deal with this all the time. In fact, I would argue that false teaching and false doctrine and false teachers are actually more of a problem today than they were for the church at Ephesus. I think this because of the phone in your pocket or the laptop that you're watching this on right now. See, in first century Ephesus, in order for you to hear false teaching, you actually had to go and hear someone stand up in front of a crowd gathered together and actually say words. You actually had to go put yourself in a position to hear false teaching. But for you and for I, we have access to deceptive ideas and false teaching all of the time. Just a little scroll through Instagram or TikTok. Maybe not TikTok, but, you know, Instagram or a Netflix show or a podcast, Christian or non-Christian or that book you ordered on Amazon, that song on Spotify, whatever it may be, all of this is preaching to us. Every type of media that you consume, every conversation that you have is preaching a sermon to you. It's telling you a message. It's telling you a story about life, where the good life is found or not found. It's telling you a story about God and and who he is or who he's not and, and what he's like or what he's not like. It's telling you a story about the world how things should be or shouldn't be. You and I were constantly bombarded with false teaching and false teachers telling us what we should think, what we should believe, and how we should live. And without even realizing it, it actually creeps into our hearts and into our minds, and it can creep into our church. Our church, which is supposed to be a foundation of the truth. 
Look at what happened by their false teaching. Look back at chapter 1, verse 19. Paul says, by their false teaching, they made shipwreck of their faith. Not only that, we actually read Paul addressing Hermeneus again in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where we read that his false teaching hasn't just shipwrecked his faith, but it's actually spreading through the church like gangrene. Paul uses this example of gangrene to talk about what false teaching does. Gangrene is, is this little infection. It often develops in a wound. Uh, if you have a wound in, your, wound in your arm or in your leg, it starts really small, this little infection. But if you don't take care of it, if you don't deal with it right away, it'll spread and often it will kill you. So what happens is if you get a gangrene infection in a limb, you often have to amputate that limb to keep the rest of the body alive. So Paul says this is what false teaching does to the church. This is what lies and deceptive ideas does to our church. This is what deceitful ideas that sound really good on the surface, but are actually contrary to the truths of God, can do to our church. It's a disease that starts so small, just a little bit here and there, and yet it spreads and it spreads and it spreads and it disrupts and it threatens the life of the church. So Paul says it has to be amputated. It has to be dealt with. It has to be cut off. So if I had to guess to our 21st century American modern minds, what's, what's going on in this passage might sound a little bit overblown, right? Like, I mean, come on, Paul. Call them out by name? Really? You got to go that far? You have to go to that extent? I want you to put yourself in their shoes, right? So let's imagine it's a year from now, and we're in Charlotte, and we've planted Citizens Church, and the, the pastors at Midtown have, have found out that we have some false teaching and some false people spreading those ideas. And so they actually write me an email. And they say, hey, Tim, we heard about what's going on. These are the false teachers. This is the false teaching. We want you to get up in front of the church and we want you to read this email. And in that email, we're going to call out by name both the false teachers and the false teaching. I think if we were in that scenario, if we were in that room, we would be tempted to think things like, Man, how close-minded can you be? Like, you're, you're shaming them, right? Like, how can you shame them like this? Or, or maybe, come on, we don't need to argue over semantics. Let's just love people. Like, let's just, let's just love them. Don't worry about all these specifics, all these nitpicky things. Let's just love. Love God. Love others. Paul just put these guys on blast in front of the entire church, called them out by name. He just told Timothy to go on the offensive, not to sit back, but actually go and tell them to stop. Probably tempted to think, come on, Paul, let it go. Just love, man. But here's what you have to understand. The truth is worth fighting for because the church is worth fighting for. Let me say that again. The truth is worth fighting fighting for because the church is worth fighting for. Remember chapter 3 verse 15. This is the church of the living God. This is God's church. This is God's family. These are the ransomed people of God that Jesus took on flesh for. Everything we celebrated with Good Friday and Easter last week. Jesus entered into humanity, bore their sin, took their punishment, died the death that they deserved. These are the people Jesus purchased for himself by his blood. And so if it's God's church and if it's God's people, that means we're supposed to be conformed more and more into the people God has called us to be. We are supposed to be with Jesus and become like Jesus. We're to believe what he's told us to believe, think what he's told us to think, be shaped how he wants us to be shaped. And that more than anything else is into a people of love. We're called to be a people of love. That's what Paul says in that verse we skipped over, verse five of 1 Timothy chapter one. Let's look at it together. He says, the aim of our charge, our teaching, our correction, our defending and fighting for the truth, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's what it means to be the people of God. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be the church? It means to be a people of love, that love God first and foremost more than anything else, and that love translates into love for others. It's what Jesus says, all the commandments of God hang on. Love for God and love for neighbor. Love, not some feeling or fleeting emotion, but true sacrificial love. Love that is modeled after the person of Jesus. Love that serves others instead of ourselves. Love that seeks the good of others no matter what. Love that works to help those around us know and follow Jesus. 
Paul says that's that's the aim of their charge, their instruction, their teaching is to grow us into a people of love. And that's the aim of our charge, our teaching, our instruction. Everything we do as community groups, everything we do on Sundays is with the goal of pushing us to be a people that love God and love our neighbor. This is what you have to understand. Truth and love go hand in hand. Truth and love go hand in hand. You see, we've created a false dichotomy between truth and love. We think we have to pit one against the other. We think that truth and love are separate things, that you can't be loving and defend the truth at the same time. Because to us, we think that defending the truth means you're probably a jerk. We overwhelmingly have a culture that values its definition of love and inclusivity at the expense of absolute truth. So we hear about what happened in 1 Timothy, how Paul calls these guys out by name in front of the whole church, tells Timothy to command them to stop spreading lies, and chances are we are more upset about the fact that people are being called out and told to stop and put on blast than we are about the fact that they are spreading lies and deceit that is harmful to the people of God. We talk about confronting false teaching. You might think, that doesn't matter. Let's just go love people. That'd be unloving to tell them they're wrong. But, but Paul is saying, Timothy, I need you to confront those false teachers so that we can go love people. Defending the truth is an act of love when false teaching is wrecking the faith of the people of God. Don't create a false dichotomy in your head. Don't pit one against the other. Don't believe the lie that defending truth and being a people of love are separate. What Paul's saying is actually the complete opposite He says the aim of right doctrine, the aim of right teaching, the aim of defending the truth is that we would grow into a people of love. This is what it means to be the church. The church is to be a pillar of truth, stewarded in such a way that we grow up into lives of love. He's saying to Timothy, don't ignore false teaching and just focus on love, but correct false teaching so that we, as the people of God, as the church, can actually grow up in love. Love requires us to defend the truth, to fight for the truth, to value the truth. Because if we don't, lies and deceit, no matter how small they start, will shipwreck our lives and spread and kill the life of our church. Because just like right teaching leads to right love, also false teaching leads to false lives. Right teaching leads to right hearts, which leads to right love. False teaching leads to false hearts, which leads to false living. False teaching leads to false living. You believe a lie, eventually you're going to start living out that lie. Right? You believe a falsehood, eventually you're going to start living out of that falsehood. Let me just give you a few examples to show this. So if we don't fight against the lie that we should just do our own thing, and look out for ourselves, and and cut out negative people out of our lives, we will never grow up into a people of love. We'll be crushed by apathy and self-security instead of being a people that learn to give our lives away in sacrifice and service for others. People that value others more than ourselves, that bend to help the person in need, that give of our time and money and possessions and resources to help and to serve. It, it, It starts small, Right, well, well, that person, they're just a little bit annoying, and, and I think I'm not supposed to keep negative people around. And this little lie, this little deceptive thing spreads and spreads, and it kills us and keeps us from being a people of love. I'll give you another one. If, if we don't fight against the lie that everything in our lives should revolve around our kids, we won't grow up into a people of love. We won't learn to prioritize the spiritual health of our family and our church family over their next activity or their next class or their next sports practice. We'll cater to their every whim and every emotion instead of actually loving them in a way that, that yes, provides for them and cares for them, but also works to grow them up to be flourishing members of society that love God and love others and contribute to the common good. I'll give you one more. If we don't fight against the lie that we are born as pretty good people, This lie that anything bad we choose to do is because of some bad in our past. Bad parenting, bad friends, whatever. The lie that we are born as good people with all good intentions and good deeds and it's only our circumstances to blame for our wrongs. If we don't push against that lie, we will not grow up into a people of love. Because the Bible tells us a different truth that all of us, you and I, are born sinful and sinners and in rebellion against God. 
Yet the good news is, like we celebrated last week, Jesus met us there, that while we were sinners, he died for us and shed his blood for us. And so if we don't learn to fight against the lie that we're just good or at best neutral people that some bad stuff has happened to, but we are actually sinners, we will never learn to embrace the good news of Jesus. We go on and on and on. False teaching leads to false living. False teaching is all around us. It can be outside the church and inside the church, and it keeps us from being a people of love. It keeps our church from being a people of love. So in this series over the next 12 weeks, we're going to talk about some uncomfortable stuff. We're trying to set the culture and the foundation of what we want to be as a church and who we want to be as the people of God. And so we're going to talk about some uncomfortable stuff that Paul addresses in 1 Timothy. We're going to talk about gender roles. What does it mean to be male and female in the church? We're going to talk about authority. What role does the church have in our lives with authority? We're going to talk about wealth and money. We're not doing this so we can nitpick. We're not doing this to to create arguments. I'm not doing this so you guys can text me and complain. I'm not, not doing this just so we can fight over nothing. We're not nitpicking battles. But we, we believe what the Bible teaches here. The church is the household of God, the people of God. And we're called as the people of God to be built up, to mature in our faith and grow into a people that love God and love others. And that actually flows out of and requires fighting for and defending and believing and clinging to truth. Right doctrine, right teaching. The truth must be taught and proclaimed and held onto and defended. The church is God's means to spread his kingdom. Nothing can stop it. That's why even in the midst of COVID and a pandemic, we step forward in faith, planting this church together because God cares about his church. And the more we learn to love what God loves, to hold fast to and defend his truth, the more his kingdom will be made known in our lives and in the city of Charlotte and wherever he calls us. Let's pray together. God, we are thankful to get to gather, even though we're separate, to get to gather together. And thanks for technology that makes that possible. Thanks for your word. Thanks for 1 Timothy. Thanks that that you want to teach us what it means to be the church, that you have not left us to figure it out or just kind of go for whatever we want to go for, God, but you have taught us what it means to be your family, to be your people, to be your household. So I just pray over this week and in the weeks to come, would you build us up into your people? Show us what it means to fight for truth, to cling to truth, to fight for right teaching, that we would grow up to be a people that love you and that love others. When people think about Citizens Church, God, would they think about love? Would they know that we fight for truth and that out of that truth comes right hearts and right living? Thanks for Jesus that makes all this possible. Purchased our ransom on the cross to forgive us our sins, to make us right with you, and yet rose again so we could have life forever. We love you. Proud of in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. See you next week.
Oh,